Om Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Om Namah Shivaya Namaste so uh, before I continue with the Mandukya Upanishad series by going into uh, either earlier or later chapters, I have still to decide, uh, I want to clarify some of the issues raised by yesterday's video. And I got some comments and messages about... <laughs> I began the video by talking about the various sectarian schools who all say that they have the highest or teach the highest enlightenment. And then I ended the video by saying <laughs> that this teaching of Mandukya Upanishad is the highest enlightenment. <laughs> so aren't I being hypocritical? Well, no. And uh, there are two reasons for that. One is that this uh, Aslesha Yoga means all-embracing. So the yoga and the realization taught in this Upanishad is all-inclusive of the lower stages of the path. It doesn't deny them except to say that they are relative truths, relative to the material creation. But in practice, they are steps on the path and cannot be rejected. And if any of them are omitted or rejected, we find that realization does not take place. This is why I criticize the neo Advaitins for trying to jump up to the platform of Jnana Yoga without having matured their practice in Karma and Bhakti and Raja Yoga. So, our position is and has always been that, well, I'm going to put up the good old chart. Here you go. These four principal yogas in the four states of consciousness have to mature and bear fruit before you can move on to the higher stages of realization. So if you have a problem, for example, in your material life that's going to stop you or distract you from authentic realization, you have to go back to the stage of karma yoga and clean that up. Or if you're deficient in, let's say, love of God, bhakti, devotion, you have to go back and develop that. Otherwise, if you offend God, that's going to block your progress too. And if you're not adept at meditation, if you can't sit and focus for four, five, six, eight, ten, twelve hours at a time, your realization, whatever it might be, is going to be very weak. And any distraction that comes along can make you fall down. So, that's why, I mean, if you look at my life, this is exactly the path I followed. I became strong in karma yoga and then developed spontaneous bhakti, then went into a long uh, practice of meditation, which led to realization. And now here we are talking about Advaita, the highest form of knowledge. So for two reasons, for the fact that our view is inclusive of all the practices, and we accept all the practices. And the second is that we don't discriminate against people who are situated on one or another of these platforms, but we see them all as part of a continuum. 
that we don't reject. We're not uh, sectarian. We don't say we have the exclusive truth because all the others are included in it. So, for that reason, we're not being hypocritical when we say that this is the highest stage of realization. Now, another point that was brought up is, on the one hand, you say that, uh, for example, the um, procreation by DNA and uh, sexuality was invented by Brahma. And on the other hand, you say that <laughs> the conception of bodily existence is simply an illusion and has to be given up. Well, maybe we didn't say exactly that, but the point is that there are different views in different states of consciousness. And the practices that we talked about just a minute ago give rise to different views on the world, on the self, on practices, and so on. And so, See, this is called non-Aristotelian logic. In Aristotelian logic, the logic invented and promoted by Aristotle, which is basically binary logic, white and black, huh? right and wrong, good and bad, saved and sinner. <laughs> See, this was the basis of Western philosophy and religion. And it's insufficient for understanding reality. I'm sorry. One small example. In dreams, all the people that you encounter, you feel like you know them. You can even sort of predict what they're going to do and, and feel and like that. But in waking consciousness, in Jagrat consciousness, most of the people you encounter you don't know and they're unpredictable. And you can't understand how they feel unless they reveal it to you. So you see, the reality appears different in different states of consciousness. In Sushupti consciousness, the world doesn't appear at all. It doesn't show up at all. And in Turiya consciousness, it's seen as unborn, a complete illusion. So naturally, then, the various philosophical truths concerning the world are only applicable in their respective states of consciousness. See? F. Scott Fitzgerald, the American philosopher, once and is all often quoted as saying, the true sign of intelligence is the ability to hold several mutually contradictory ideas in the mind at once. And this is certainly true of spiritual life and particularly the consciousness. Because in the four states of consciousness, the world appears different. So does the self. And the explanations that we have to come up with in our mind to explain these logically to ourselves are going to be mutually contradictory. They have to be. See, this is why scientists are so scared of consciousness and they try to explain it away in so many different ways. But they can't because consciousness is axiomatic, absolute, and fundamental to absolutely everything else. So we have these four states that we experience every single day. Waking, dreaming, deep sleep, and the underlying substrate of awareness of awareness, Turiya. So whether we realize it or not, <laughs> we are always holding these contradictory ideas in our minds. Now, the false notion is that there is one truth that applies always and everywhere to everyone and everything. 
This is an axiom of scientific thought. It's part of the whole mindset of reductionism, which tries to boil everything down to a few simple truths. <laughs> but life is not simple. Life is complicated. People are complicated. The world is very complicated. So just for an example, in Jagrat consciousness, we see the world and it appears real. And it seems to have rigid physical laws that every object is subject to and follows. But in dream consciousness, anything can happen. <laughs> one scenario can just melt into another one without any seeming change of context. And you can fly sometimes and you can do all kinds of things that you can't do in Jagra consciousness. So does that make one wrong and the other one right? Well, the scientists and materialist philosophers and Christians and so on who follow dualist Aristotelian logic would tell us so. But that becomes an obstacle, that becomes a stumbling block, because then we are trying to deny a vital part of ourselves. For example, dreams. If we try to deny the reality of dreams in the state of uh, Jagrat consciousness, huh? now that I'm awake, my dreams appear like illusions. They're, so they're not true and they have no value and I can just re reject them and deny their value and like that. Well, yet you're going to get in trouble because dreams are a vital function of the mind to digest the experiences of everyday life. And if you reject them, you're going to miss a vital sense of inspiration and resolution of outstanding mental and emotional issues. And the same goes with Sushupti. Well, it's just nothing, people say. Huh? So they reject it. But sleep researchers have found that without an adequate time of dreamless sleep, people go crazy in just a few days, a couple of weeks at most. If they're denied, like given some electric shock or something to wake them out of, out of deep sleep every time they go into it, they can't survive. They lose it. So <laughs> without these states, we become unhealthy mentally and physically. So they're vital. They're important. They have value. We can't reject them. We have to include them in our worldview. That means the worldview based on the four states of consciousness is really the only worldview that makes any sense. Because everybody has these four states every day, and really all the time. And it just depends on where we put our attention, what kind of experience we have. Like most people daydream, isn't it? You'll be doing one thing, say some routine physical work, and at the same time you're thinking of something completely different. <laughs> so are you going to give that up? Are you going to put yourself down every time you have a daydream? See, we're taught in school, for example, that you shouldn't daydream. You should always be physically present. I call this compulsive extroversion. It's taught as part of the social conditioning in school. And what this does is it makes us unhealthy. If we can't dream, we can't create. And sure enough, most children sing and draw and um, if they could, they would write huh, spontaneously all kinds of wild creative stuff. But that goes away at a certain age because of school training, because it's discouraged. It's taught that it's wrong. So you see, really, the only solution to being a complete human being 
is to accept all these four states, these four views, these four yogas, even though it involves embracing mutual contradictions, <laughs> that's okay, because that is the reality. And there is not one single truth that applies to everything and everyone at all times and places. That's just the way it is. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya. <laughs>